Hello. Let me just get Alana back in here. Does it work? Okay, great. <laughs> good morning. Um, let's just wait a couple minutes. Good morning, Glenn, please. Or good afternoon for you, 2 p.m. Eastern time. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Bear with us with this new um, format <laughs> Instagram has thrown on us. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. Maybe we can get started yes um so thank you everyone for for joining us for our second charla of the series on the occasion of the exhibition experiments on stone for women artists from the tamarind lithography workshop i'm here today with glenda Lise, who i will read a quick bio in just a sec but before i get started i want to acknowledge here from my office in sherman heights san diego i'm on the traditional territory of the Kumiai. Um, so, as I said, we're here on the occasion of Experiments on Stone, and Glenda Lee, let me read a quick bio, and then we can kind of get into the slides. Um, Glenda Lee Medina is an Afro-Caribbean New Yorkian conceptual interdisciplinary visual artist who was born in Puerto Rico and raised in the Bronx. Medina received her MFA from Hunter College, New York, and has presented her artwork at such notable venues as the Betis Art Museum in Miami, Participant Inc., New York, Artist Space, New York, the Bronx Museum of Art, El Museo de Vario, the Museum of Contemporary Art, Vigo, Spain, and the Studio Museum in Harlem, among others. Medina is currently a professor at the School of Visual Arts, MFA Art Practice Program, and lives and works in New York. Work in regards to experiments on stone. Um, the exhibition brings together four artists, Annie Albers, um, Louise Snevelson, Ruth Asawa, and Gecko. And if we go to the next slide, we, Glenda Lisa and I, we've talked about your work having natural affinities with two of the artists in the exhibition. Here we see um, Annie Albers, and I'm interested in the connection between your work in regards to the materiality of your prints, right? And we'll talk about that um, in your later 2019 bank statements prints. But then we also see commonalities between um, Louise Nevelson, if we see that on the next slide, um, in regards to your abstract visual language, which I think is quite nice. So we see Nevelson here um, kind of builds with materials, creating this kind of abstract language. And I know language is something that is really important to your work, especially this abstracted language, right? So maybe we'll start, if we go to the next slide, um, with this 2012 work, Black and Gold. Um, and then let's just hear a little bit about you. I know it's a, a lot of me introducing you, but, um, and I promise we'll give you lots of time to talk, but I'm super curious if we, if, I think this is a nice intro work to hear about language, abstracted language, um, geometry in many ways. Um, this work came from a piece I call Boombox. And so what you see before you is like an, a, the basic forms that you would see on the boombox, like speakers, tape decks, buttons, an equalizer. And um, I, I just changed the orientation and rearranged the forms to create, to still convey this iconic image, but I also wanted to create a signature for myself, right. uh, a signature tag, um, because a lot of my practice uses hip hop culture and tries to recontextualize it. Uh, so this is really where Black Gold came from. It came from trying to build a visual language, knowing that that language had to be abstracted because I couldn't, um, I couldn't talk about breaking the frame and still be in the frame. I couldn't talk about how language um, contains us and still be like in the Roman alphabet, which is what right. I was doing prior to, to this. So that's really where Black Gold came from. And I think of it as um, like alphabets. Like those are, these are my letters. These 50 shapes are the letters that I have to work with. Mm -hmm. And so I rearrange them and I use them in different forms and different ways and different materials to convey my ideas. Yeah, and I think what's really interesting about this particular work, but then as we move forward in, in looking at your other work, um, and you, you kind of touch on this, is the idea of the alphabet or 
um, and, and this like new language in this way. Um, but certainly I think, you know, we've discussed this. This is something that's interesting um, and specific to you is it has something to do with identity as we move forward, right? That you're um, Puerto Rican, so you're constantly looking back to um, indigeneity and to Taino um, culture and and what that does. And I think even the gold, right, is something that is is implicit to uh, the colonialism of the Americas, right, and and Taino culture. So I think that's also something that is quite interesting. Yeah, I'm always looking back, but also the the I'm also looking at the place where I grew up too. Like, what's what's indigenous to that place? What comes from that place? And that's why hip hop is so important to me too. It's like I'm looking at Taino history, pre-Columbian history that relates to Puerto Rico and all of Hispaniola, but I'm also looking at things that influence the Bronx, you know, because that's where I grew up. So trying to join these two things together, because that's what I am. Right. Um, and I think that's great. And I think, you know, you mentioned the boom box and we don't have a have an image here, but I think this is something that you um, have continued to, to think about, right? Like that hip hop is its own language, but now you're trying to translate that language into um, your work, into prints. And um, as you said, in a tag, and I, I want our viewers to constantly be reminded that this idea of, a written language is not always the alphabet or it's not always the Roman language, right? So I just want to kind of reiterate that point. Yeah, I mean, I'm searching for a pictorial language, a language that everyone can understand no matter what language you speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, that's really poetic and it's really beautiful. I think, especially in regards to language uh, in Spanish, right? Or, or when we talk about larger issues of Latinx, right? Not everyone speaks Spanish, not everyone speaks um, indigenous, languages but we all have a commonality which i think is quite nice in some ways so um so thank you i think that's a really nice thing to ponder and think about as we continue our conversation um but if we go to the next slide you know i, I briefly talked about taino elements and i think this is a really beautiful print that is a nice um segue into that so i wonder if you want to speak a little bit about that well you know i this is not that old. Maybe this is like 2018. Mm -hmm. And this print came from collecting all of these symbols. I was doing an extensive amount of research at the Puerto Rican, uh, the library here at Hunter College of Puerto Rican Studies. And I was collect collecting what little there is. Not little, but there is quite as, not as much <laughs> as I would have hoped. And just like trying to gather all these motifs and all this kind of symbols that Tainos use, not only in like carving into stone, but carving into wood um, and just collecting them. So I wanted to create some kind of like a body, body kind of response to this. That's why I use the color scheme that I use. It's like, this is my brown body. Everyone is pink inside and you know, <laughs> Taino is written all over my face. <laughs> well, kind of, you know, I, I think it depends on where I am, what people think I am. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm in New York, they're probably gonna think I'm Puerto Rican, Dominican or black. If I'm in LA, because, you know, everybody has their different interpretations of what people are supposed to look like. So for me, it was kind of just like, uh, like leveling the playing field mm -hmm. uh, by, by putting brown and putting pink together. And then also creating kind of like, this is not only my signature, it's not only black gold anymore. Now I somehow want to really um, express the completeness of who I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think what's really interesting is that you kind of touch on this, this hybrid existence that you might exist in, you know, certainly um, Latinx people do exist in this kind of hybrid space of, of not like being here nor there. Um, and I think this idea is, is something that is so poignant in this print, but also just throughout your work. Um, and I think what's, what's so nice about bringing Taino imagery like front and center is that you're kind of talking about this, this hybridity that exists mm -hmm. in this way. Yeah, definitely. I feel and I feel like it's not just among people who speak Spanish. Like, I think in America, there is a lot of hybridity. There's people that feel in between two cultures and feel transcultured and, and are trying to fit in this world that nobody, you know, they don't really fit. You know, it's like the world of your family and the world of America. It's like, where do you find the balance in between those two things? And um, yeah, I think a lot of people are feeling that way. So I just want to talk about some of your research. So I know you said you, you worked at Centro um, to for um, some of these, these this imagery. And I think um, it is, it's just interesting to hear a little bit more about your process there. 
Um, it's diff it was quite difficult actually because you cannot touch any of the archive. Like you can't like rummage through the stacks. Right. You have to actually know what you're looking for, um, which could be a little. It was a lot of conversations between me and the librarian. <laughs> like, can you just give me the whole roll? Like, you know, I want this one book, but just give me everything on that roll and just like flipping through it and just it just flipping through it and reading and taking what I could use and what I couldn't use. And, and um, that was basically the process. So I would love to go back there and do a little bit more research, but right now it's impossible. Right. Um, but yeah, it was kind of like trying to find the needle in the haystack, you know, <laughs> that right. kind of experience. I'm really appreciative that they exist and that there is an archive and that I can go there. Um, and I'm grateful to have conversations with the librarian. Uh, <laughs> But you know, anyone that really enjoys research wants to like, you know, peruse the stacks, <laughs> which is not possible there. You have to know what you're looking for, or well, at least know um, what topics are of major interest to you. So. Yeah, I think it's really nice to hear your insight. And I think, and I asked this question, I apologize, we hadn't discussed asking this question, but um, I think it's, it's always interesting to hear how artists arrive to certain things. And, and certainly I think our viewers are, are always interested to hear um, about the research that you that goes into um, making prints, you know, and especially because you already have, you know, this abstract visual language that you're kind of moving forward with, but then that you're continually changing this, you're doing your own research, it's evolving over time. And so I know we talked about this print being from 2018, but then um, as you move forward, uh, if we go to the next slide, I know this is their bank statements are from 2019, right? So they're still it, yeah. another, it's still continuing your, your visual language that we saw in black gold that we saw in your last print. Um, but this kind of brings up the materiality that I had kind of introduced with, um, it, with, um, excuse me, Ruth Asawa, right? So if we saw on the earlier side with Ruth Asawa, she, um, was able to create so many prints at the Tamarind, like she was able to create 50 prints, really unprecedented. And in that time, she experimented with different papers, right? So we see this like kind of sensual pulpy paper with these like deep inks. And, um, and I'm interested to hear about, of course, the iconography, your language, the movement of um, black gold to this new project. Um, but I'm also interested to hear about how you made this paper, right? So we, we kind of talked about the, the materiality of the paper and these prints. Um, I actually made this paper, I finished the artwork in 2019, but I made the paper in 2012. Yeah. Um, and at the time I was in Rome and I was, I really wanted some black paper, <laughs> but they didn't, didn't really have black paper. So I went, by the suggestion of many people to this artist's studio called Roberto Manino, and he's a paper maker. And he was like, instead of buying the paper I make, why don't you just make your own paper? Mm -hmm. And I was just like, yeah, <laughs> I want to do that. <laughs> so I had, collected, I had collected like bank statements. Right. I had collected like bank statements. So I had this rag paper and I uh, mixed it with cotton. And I was thinking about what paper does, like historically, like documents culture. Um, and I somehow wanted to create my own currency. Like I wanted to imprint my language um, uh, as a, like a form of like cultural equity. Like how do I create cultural equity? Like how do I create my own currency? Um, and how do, how, do, how do I do it in a way that conveys like colonialism in a kind of way, but also like, um, like my own language? you know, and my own kind of history. So I created like, and I made a lot of paper. Right. These happened to be like a group that I collected together um, because they all use bank statements. Some of the paper doesn't use banks. Some of, some of the paper is black. Some, you know, so I, 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 so I was basically making paper for about four months, five months when I was in Rome, yeah. um, which was super fun. And then when I came back to New York, I had all this paper and I started to, to contextualize it a little bit more, like add some gold, add some spray paint flakes, like really mm -hmm. trying to make it a luscious object, uh, something that's not just uh, bank statements and cotton put together, but something that's like um, attractive. And right. there's nothing, you, you know, gold attracted a whole country to come over here. You know, <laughs> most, it's, it's like 
gold is attractive and, and gold is very important in my practice mm-hmm. because of its relationship to colonialism, but relationship to the sun too. Right. Yeah. If we go to the next slide, I think we have a detail of, um, of one of the prints. And so I wonder if um, you can tell us a little bit more about how um, black gold really inspired movement from this. Um, and if you're continuing to work with, with your handmade paper, which I think is really fascinating. Um, This was the first time that I broke the stencil, meaning like this is the first time I'm using shapes independently from all 50 together. Mm -hmm. Uh, Prior to then, I felt the the need to to keep them together so so that people can understand this is one set. Um, But when I made the paper, I decided to split that set into... um, I don't know, like six or seven sets. And right now I'm, I'm still working on, I, I, I somehow want to create some kind of syntax from the alphabet themselves, like from the black gold itself, from the shapes themselves, so that two, these two shapes must be together to be understood. And these two shapes must be together to be understood because I want to uh, have a balance between like complete abstraction, like completely no reference and a reference because I'm trying to be in between like a pictorial language and like completely abstract. And I'm mm-hmm. trying to balance those two things constantly. So that's where the composition comes from. And the size of the paper, um, just like a traditional size paper. I mean, I thought about making it like the size of currency, but. <laughs> I mean, that could be interesting. I think, um, I think what's kind of nice is that this conceptual idea that uh, you're using fake statements to make this paper. There is this kind of like conceit about that, that we don't entirely know that it's a bank statement unless we look at the title. Yeah. And so that, that additional layer, which I, of course, appreciate. <laughs> I think it's really interesting. If you look really close, you can see letters, like oh. this letters in the statement, like T's and P's and I's and all types of stuff. But you mm-hmm. need to really look close. But, the, you know, that's why I titled that titled them that way so people can get an understanding that this is where this comes from. Mm-hmm. Like this is about money or right. about wealth or about value of some sort. Mm-hmm. So you had a residency in Rome and this is where you started create, where you created the paper, but then you're continuing to use this paper today. Yeah, I still have some of the paper. I still have some of the paper. It was, you know, it was always supposed to be the base of something else. Mm-hmm. The paper itself wasn't the art, the art right. to me. It was just like the base of something else. Uh, so yeah, I still have I still have a few sheets. <laughs> I would like to make paper again. Hint, hint to the world out there. <laughs> if you want to give me a residency in the paper making studio? Um, but yeah, I, I, paper is so interesting because it collects. Mm-hmm. It collects histories. It collects ideas. It it's it's a very interesting thing, especially when I'm talking about like. Uh, uh, indigenous culture that's been eradicated, like paper is very significant to me. Or, you know, the fact that, you know, not a lot of Latinx people are written about in books, that's that's also really important to me. Um, <laughs> Both. <laughs> yeah, that, hopefully that's all gonna change. Um, but yeah, keeping a record and being part of the record. Mm-hmm. Um, important, yes. Yeah, and I think there is, there's something about paper and, and um, as a medium, right, in a different way from sculptures and painting, that paper and prints are, have this disseminate, like, they're more easily disseminated in a way um, that is um, really radical, right? And I think we we often forget that, that the origins of prints and, and works on paper really was that. Um, and so I'm pleased to hear your, your description of, of works on paper. And, and certainly um, it's just so, so nice to think about, I think, in this way. Yeah, and it's mass produced. Like yeah. you, uh, it, the, 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 the exchange is so quick, you know? It's not like I have to put it in a crate and ship it to you. You know, it's like, it's, it's, insane, it's in, t- instantaneous. Instantaneous, right. yeah, the exchange. Yeah. Or can it, be. It can be, right. Um, so if we go to the next slide, there is another work. Um, this is the exercise one from 2019. And again, it's about language. But I know you had said that you're interested in mirroring language, that you're now changing the alphabet. So it's become yeah. So I'm curious about this and how you've kind of arrived to this. 
Well, after like drawing with 50 shapes for a couple of years, you get kind of tired of the 50 shapes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, even I need a little bit of a, you know, a challenge. So I decided, you know, what I'm interested in is not only the shapes, but it's like the silences in between words. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm like taking the black gold stencil and I'm mirroring it on top of one another. Um, so this is exercise one is really instructional. It tells you how to create your own visual language, pick an object, break it into shapes, mirror it at a certain degree, 90 degrees, 180 and 45. And that's how I arrived at the three last images of that uh, exercise one. So I have like a double square, which is just two squares on top of one. I mean, the two circles on top of one another. So it's double circle, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, the, the diamond shape and the square, that's just from mirroring, mirroring black gold on top of one another at different angles. And it creates space, but also your eye wants to complete the, the object. Like it wants to complete the circle, even if there's not a circle there. Right. And so, that was very interesting to me because it's like it's it's creating how do i say this it's creating like uh dissonance but connectivity at the same time mm -hmm. um which is just an added layer of like like how i feel or how many of us might feel like we're connected to this society but at the same time feel broken apart into pieces mm -hmm. um yeah, and now I have more than 50 shapes to to deal with. And the shapes that come from the three last one go inside the bigger shapes. Mm. So it really is like layering on top of layering, even though I'm breaking them apart. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think at first I was kind of drawn to when we, in our initial conversation, you talked about mirroring. Um, you know, it reminds me of kind of the origins of, of printmaking or um, you know, there is a scientist who found the idea of mirroring cells was, and he, he was a printmaker and he, that's how he kind of discovered that. And I think that mirror is, is something that I find really interesting. And um, of course was, withdrew me to this work, right? And the idea of, of printmaking as a vehicle to show mirror um, is, is fascinating. It is. It is, you have me thinking now, you know, cause a lot, you know, my, the thing about my prints, it's like, it doesn't, like, it doesn't really matter how I set them down because the, the image doesn't change when it's mirrored. Mm -hmm. It's always the same. Um, but I do, when I have to add like lettering, like words, cause this print is a print, this is a silk screen. I have to think about mirroring in that aspect, but yeah. You have me thinking now. <laughs> <laughs> Plant the seed. <laughs> but yeah. if you go to the next slide, um, this is a nice, and I know you talked about instructions, and so you, um, it's just a kind of a close up of your instructions of how um, the alphabet kind of evolves and is, is mirrored. Yeah, yeah. That it, it gives you like step by step instructions on how to do it yourself, which is like <laughs> an important part of my practice to like learn something and give it away. Mm hmm. Um, and then if we go to the next slide, we, this is um, the black book from 2019. And it goes back to what I kind of reiterated early on about um, graffiti lettering, right? This is something that you're always thinking about. Um, so I wonder if you want to talk a little bit about this book. Well, the last print, the exercise one, so I'm using all those stencils to make 26 letters that are influenced by graffiti and like landscape architecture, mm -hmm. like blueprints. Mm -hmm. um, and this started like in 2012, you know, the first thing I did after making the paper was to try to create the Roman alphabet, mm -hmm. which is what this kind of is. Uh, so I continued that series for a while until I finished it. Um, but that work made me really realize that I'm not really that interested in like <laughs> the Roman alphabet. <laughs> um, but sometimes you start, or start a piece and you, ha you have to finish it. So I made 26 letters that are influenced by, yeah, graffiti lettering and the Roman alphabet and kind of like landscape uh, uh, architectural drawings, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, I think in the next slide we have a, a close up. And I think what's kind of interesting, um, and you know, reminds me, you know, the point that we're, we're here to, about some natural affinities with some of the artists in the exhibition. And I think of, I often think of Louise Nevelson as someone that is intimately interested in architecture, right? Um, 
and that we think of her in a way that she's world building, or this is how I like to think of her. Um, and in her prints, especially, right, she's using different materials to build her, her architectural scene, right? And I think what's kind of interesting is that, you know, she still is informed by architecture. And I think your blueprints, and that this is how it kind of informs you, but still interested in language, is a nice kind of commonality between you two. You know, what's interesting is the first time I saw Louise Nevelson, I was in Rome. And I was like really fascinated by her sculptural like objects. Uh, she had like a survey show that was going on there. And I was also fascinated by the architecture of like uh, cathedrals and churches there and the way that the tiles navigate people to certain spaces. Right. Um, so yeah, I would, you know, I'm a, I'm a Louise Nevelson fan. Um, I also think like when I saw her work for the first time, her work really reminded me of uh, Joaquin Torres Garcia, I think is his name. Yeah, that is, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I was like, wow, this is like the sculptural way of like doing his work. And I thought to myself, and I really like this idea of like taking something that's discarded, uh, reworking it and like making it into something else, something structural, something systematic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think her work is great. Yeah, and I do find some nice commonalities there, um, especially between these works on paper. I think um, they do have this kind of architectural quality to them that I think is important to to reference. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, thank you for talking about all of these. And in our next slide, I know a couple of things that you're working on, and you've recently been included in this excellent exhibition, Latinx Abstract Art at Brick in Brooklyn. So if we have any watchers or viewers from New York, please do go see it. And I think, you know, it's such an important exhibition um, to highlight. But I'm curious to hear a little bit about your new work and what you're working on now. Um, I am working on these, turning these into sculptural, like relief sculptures. Um, and this work, this is called, I don't know what COVID color study number it is. They're usually uh, <laughs> named by date. And mm -hmm. when the pandemic hit, I was having a lot of trouble making work and I had to make work. So I gave myself an exercise, um, which was to go outside and take a walk with my, with my mother's dog and to find something to be grateful for and really look at it, like really appreciate the fact that I can see um, mm -hmm. and not take a snapshot of it, but really like deeply look at something uh, and then come back upstairs and put that color down. And so the, all the color studies are basically the same composition, uh, which reminds me of Asawa. You know, she uses a lot of she, uh, yeah. changing the same, but kind of the same kind of motifs. Right. Um, and she drew every day. I, I don't, I wish I could draw every day, but I don't draw every day. I draw like three times a week. Um, <laughs> yeah just thinking about how can i bring some kind of joy to my daily practice because this was really joyful to make um, right to give myself this assignment to find gratitude and then there's not there's no way i cannot find joy in that kind of exercise so mm -hmm. uh that was my way to like kick things off and now i'm turning like two of these color studies into a relief sculpture mm -hmm. uh, so that's yeah. what i'm working on yeah What's about these is I know that they're color studies and I when we we started talking about this and I said well I hope these are standalone works because I think they're they're really beautiful and I think they're really interesting and kind of continue your lineage of of what you're doing um and I in the next slide I see it framed um a, a study kind of framed which is nice um and so do you plan to kind of show these as standalone works or pair them with this the sculptures yeah i like to pair them with the sculpture <laughs> i like yeah. to pair. so this is called the owl and um th there's a series of these works i think there's like nine or ten of them there might be 11 i'm not sure yet um which are supposed to tell a narrative and so the owl was thought of to be the first witness to life by the taino indians so i have an owl and i have a son that's part of brick uh, show right. This part of brick show right now, and um, they're really characters in this kind of narrative that I'm building, um, which is trying to you know, like I was saying before, like set two shapes that need to be together. Like these two shapes have to be together to be understood. These two shapes have to be together to be understood. 
but also trying to create like character traits out of them, like mm -hmm. by the design. So the mm -hmm. design on this is uh, owls, owls that I have found like during my research, like finding what Tainos would consider an owl or what people have thought could be an owl from their, um, from the research they've collected. So this, this is basically my owl. And then I turned it into a sculpture um, but I definitely like to pair them with one another because a lot of times it's not an exact replica. Like things right. change. Like right. You have complete control over paper and pen. <laughs> eh, you know, other things can happen when you change the material, you know, <laughs> things you never even thought of. Yeah, absolutely. If we go to the next slide, we can see um, how this has become a sculpture. Um, and this is currently up at one of, in, at Brick, correct? This is this one and the owl and the two drawings that they come from. So mm -hmm. this is the sun. This is my second character. Um, I know it doesn't quite look like a sun, but it's it's the sun for me. And also the the um, the motifs on the pizza itself is supposed to be a sun. Like you know, mm -hmm. it's supposed to be the sun for its sign. So it's kind of come, and it's supposed to look like the rays and all these other kind of things that are coming up for me and active because the sun moves. So it's just. Yeah, that's where the composition comes. And so these are the two tape decks put together. So you saw the bank statements where the points were up, and now right. you see the, the points down, and you see other, um, I don't know, iconography on it. Ex right. Yeah, and the next slide we have a, a detail. Um, oh, yeah. It's just oh, shows use how intricate this all is, right? <laughs> I forgot to say the materiality changes too. So the work that you see is not like a drawing. It's just, it's on wood. I use nails. I this on this one I use uh, wire. Mm -hmm. On the owl I use thread, and so it's quite laborious. Yeah, <laughs> it's quite laborious, but also you know it's worth the effort. As I tell people, it was like painful but worth the effort because after I saw it, I was just like, wow, you know, I can't believe that came out of me. You know, it was like because you know for so long it's in your mind. Mm -hmm. And then when you see it in real life, you know, sometimes it fails you. Like sometimes it doesn't look as good as you imagine. Sometimes it looks just like you imagine. And then sometimes it looks better than what you imagined. Right. And, you know, I'm just aiming it for like to look for what I imagine, you know? So when it, it, when it supersedes that, I'm always like, wow, you know, this is kind of nice. <laughs> you know? I mean, I do, I do appreciate that, that, you know, you're, you probably, you have something, a vision that is on paper, right, and it kind of transforms into something else. Um, which again, like I, my last plug for the Sawa as um, as an artist who really started. I mean, her career really was at the draft table, right? We recognize yeah. her really diaphanous sculptures, um, but she had to understand what she meant to do um, first on paper, right? And I think it was so nice about your practice, especially these um, kind of big, beautiful works. And, you know, I hope to see in person when, when we can travel again. Um, but I do like this, this relationship between the paper and the finished product of um, the sculpture and this really, um, and the materiality of your sculpture, right? That it's not just, um, you know, flat three dimensional, but there's, you know, so much labor into it and, and everything seems to have a purpose and um, has an important element to to the the work itself yeah i'm not sure if asawa would have made her sculpture without going through all the process of drawing and print making all these other things because it really makes you feel like you have a grasp for, for the idea right you know it's really important to me yeah to draw before doing anything right no i agree well glendalise thank you so much um if we have any questions please um well, I guess now I can't see the Q&A box in this new Instagram format. But if you have questions, write them in the comments. Um, if we can't get to your question. Um... Oh, oh, I can see the questions. Oh, great. Do you, Do see you a... see... Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Do you see a relationship between the gold shapes, the alphabet, and jewelry? I... And then I can't see the rest of it, the rest of the question. But yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've dabbled in jewelry making, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, 
my jewelry tends to be a little ch chunky and I wish it was a little bit more refined. <laughs> but yeah, I see a correlationship, a correlationship between those three things. And I just want to thank for everybody for coming. Yes, of course. Thank you for watching. And uh, this um, recording will be available on our IGTV, on YouTube to continue watching. Um, again, we're sharing. Um, it's all over. It's going to be all over the place. It'll be everywhere forever. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. Good Talk about cataloging. <laughs> yeah. Um, but if, if anyone has questions, feel free to DM the Instagram, MCAC's Instagram account, and we can kind of distribute the, um, the question. Um, thank you, of course, to my colleague, Anthony Graham, who has so graciously um, provided us his time and his computer to stream these images in this new Instagram format. Uh, thank you to my colleagues at the America Society for showing me that this is indeed possible in this new format. Um, and of course, to Glendalise and for your time and being so generous speaking yeah, with us. Thank, thank you guys for inviting me. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been yeah. fun. And thank you, Anthony. I know it was a last minute curveball. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah. thank thank you everyone for watching make sure you tune in um to our next charla um next month with nicola lopez um and follow glenda Lise on instagram so you can keep up with all of her work and um continue to follow us on instagram to keep up with it yeah well yeah. thank you thank you so much glenda Lise. thank you everyone for watching okay okay Bye. Bye. <laughs>